Hello, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today we're going to do a fast and loose watercolor tonalist landscape painting. Though this one is going to have a little bit of a different beginning than my other watercolor videos. Uh, quick backstory. There is just an imaginary scene in my head that I wanted to paint yesterday, and I couldn't get it down on paper. I had a landmass in the foreground that I kept growing larger and larger. So, what I did was I did two um, videos exploring Conte as a sketching medium and preparation for a painting. Each one of these took about 10 minutes with introduction, talking, etc. So, I sketched them out, explored the tonal values, um, the compositional shape. I'm honestly not even sure which I'm going to use, but my main goal is to now Let's uh, just set this one on the side. I'll kind of look at it and reference it. Now I'm going to mark with pencil just a quick idea of these locations, of these masses, and rely on this during the wet and wet stage to create just those um, spaces that I was just preventing from... Um, taking place that I was just making too large. So this is just a old um, Eversharp uh, pencil. It um, You just put the leads in it and um, put a 4H lead. It's a 1.1 millimeter, I believe, which um, they don't really make pencils in that size anymore. There is one company uh, in America that's doing that now, a legendary lead company. And that's how I bought these leads from a few years ago. All right, so I'm going to try to keep myself within these confines. And I'm not even sure if these uh, pencil marks showed up. Um, a few painters come to mind with those pencil marks whenever you are uh, starting a watercolor painting. Uh, Frankie Clark, he has a lot of videos up on YouTube and he has a lot of his own materials that he sells. And he has some guidelines. I think he usually does a border mark, a horizontal line, and then might do kind of the main masses in this fashion. Uh, Rick S who has just a lovely watercolor painting approach and style. He, I think, does his sketches before the video. So he'll do um, some preparatory work there. And then he will apply masking fluid on those spots and then uh, paint from there. So there's a whole bunch of different approaches to watercolor landscape painting. Um, and even fast and loose with uh, sketching beforehand, with not sketching, and even how you go about uh, preparing the paper. So I just coated it with water. Uh, it's a uh, Stonehenge Aqua 11 by 14, 11 by 15 quarter sheet, 100% um, cotton, 140 pound cold press. All right. I'm going to grab my raw sienna and it feels weird having even any pencil marks on there. With oil painting, we would maybe take a brush and loosely kind of sketch in uh, with our paint, just the outline, just kind of getting an idea of what we're working on. With um, pencil, we would make gentle marks like this to build up our scene. But with watercolor, I really haven't done much of that. Though, all of my watercolor, and I'm grabbing some ultramarine now, has been built off of uh, books, uh, YouTube videos, and um, learning from others. It's, uh, wow, Hammy, good jump. Now it is kind of weird, um, like I said, painting for me, 
with those marks there. Though, it makes me want to um, be gentler in my approach, if that makes sense. I'm not saying that's, that's a good thing or a bad thing. I just feel that um, happening with this. We'll see how much of it shows through at the end. Like I said, I used a 4H, which is a very um, light lead. I'm gonna grab ultramarine and um, light red oxide for my background mountain. I think I just sketched it in like that. There we go. Yeah, so the 4H, I think it's more I think they mix clay into it uh, or or something into um, leads and the higher the number gets in the H direction the lighter it is the harder it is and the um, the B direction like your 2B or 4B as your B gets larger it gets um, darker and softer I, th I think it's probably softer as well so probably less of uh, whatever clay is mixed in. Now, I am trying to increase this tonally, just increasing the value so this comes forward in the picture plane. Um, the sky is wet, this background mountain is wet, uh, everything's wet so it's gonna blend and it's gonna move throughout and I can use my paper towel to uh, mitigate some of that. I could also do dry offs and paint in each one at a time. I grab some burnt sienna, warm us up for this midground. I'm going to consider this portion right here the midground. I'll call this one the foreground, the closest landmass, and I'll refer to this guy as the background, just to make things easier for us. All right, so I can see some of my pencil marks, but I am starting to lose some of them. I'm gonna grab some Payne's Gray. And play with my masses now. So I'm working on the mid ground one. I'm paying attention to its reflections and that S shape that's occurring here. Uh, with this composition, just, it's an imaginary scene, but my vertical height of this mass, this one will have to be larger than this edge right here in order just to simply create a very easy um, perspective of a recession. Now, I could play around with the paper towel and lift some of these out. And I can go back in at later stages. I am flatting out my paper. But I really like to get a lot done in the wet and wet stage. I just really like the, the, the feel of it. And um, in yesterday's exploration of this, for the most part, my background mountain stayed where it was at wet and wet. Pain's gray.
You can see where I marked the paper using the brush itself to show you the, um, the relationship between those masses. It does seem like uh, marking the paper with uh, any type of marring device like this will make more of a lasting impression than um, the pencil itself. So I wonder if, uh, no, it wouldn't be worth marring the paper for my outline. But that might be an interesting uh, just painterly approach. So we'll store that one away for a later day. All right, I think I am pretty happy where we're at now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna do a dry off, and then we'll do our next stage. All right, so we're relatively dry. It softened beautifully. I love the wet and wet. Um, looking for pencil mark making, I can see it here, a little bit there. But I really have to search out for those pencil marks. Um, and once again, that was the 4H, so that was a very light marking pencil. Um, more importantly, the areas that I gestured to and marred deliberately with the back of the brush to show you those things, that stands out way more than any pencil mark. So um, I think that's an important takeaway. Now, let's play around with our mid-ground mass. So I referred to this one as our mid-ground. And I'm not gonna clean the brush or anything. I'm just gonna start putting my paint in. And whenever we put this paint down, we're now creating um, new areas of wet and we can explore it like a wet and wet. For example, I'm gonna grab some Payne's Gray and I can dap into that and the areas that I had just marked, I can feed in and get that to diffuse. Let's bring that land mass down and we'll explore its reflection on the water. I'm just using the edge of the hake brush and barely letting it touch the paper. I'm going to grab some raw sienna and just feed some of that in and get to my variation. Um, lately, I've been doing a lot of portrait experimentation, um, been playing with dry media. So my water color game is not super on point right now. But with practice and playing around like this, you can throw, uh, grow the skills really quickly again. Um, the squirrel mop brushes, the number one, the number four rigger, all those things can be used in place of the brush, um, the hake. I'll bring that waterline down. There we go. Throw out some vertical marks in here. We can scrape in this region too. I can even grab, I've been playing with the gamboge, gamboge a lot lately whenever I have been grabbing the watercolor and using that as my yellow as opposed to lemon yellow. Mainly just because it's just so, I don't know what it is, like, um, I was talking to Joe Menza and Matthew Clemens, and they were almost saying like it's a, a mustard yellow. The original gamboge, I believe, was sap from a tree, and it was um, toxic. 
In fact, fun little fact, here's some uh, chips uh, from Chinese brush painting of that. I just never really got around to using them because um, I didn't really know how dangerous they were. So it's kind of just like a little interesting thing that I have. Okay. I think I am pretty happy with this. We'll just leave it here. Um, we'll do a dry off and then play around with our next section. Actually, yeah, let's do our dry off because I just don't want the two to blend together. All right, it feels dry enough. So let's grab some raw sienna. Get some painterly brush strokes, some burnt sienna. some burnt umber. I'll bring down the reflections of this mass. Payne's gray. some of that down. Just playing with texture and getting some interesting things going on in this mass, this portion. It still feels very, very weird. Um, like I said, uh, kind of sketching just even the little masses and then kind of painting within them. Use a scraping tool, throw some texture in there. It's a whole lot of different fun stuff you can do. We'll put some trees in. I probably shouldn't put the tool with paint on it. On let's go here. Now I've um, repeatedly mentioned that there, are, you know, things that you you learn about yourself that you know that you have difficulty with, and um, my mid-sized trees or small trees in this portion, proportion in this shape, um, give me difficulty. So we'll play around with that. And that's one of the goals of this composition is for me to practice that and to work on those. Other ways to do that is to um, look at master painters and see how they tackled that issue. Um, working from master paintings uh, and playing around uh, from other things that we see. That being said, I'm not calling myself a master at all, but if you like any of this stuff, if you want to follow along, you are more than welcome to do that. Um, and of course, you are always welcome to sign your own name to anything that you do whenever you follow along with any of my videos. Um, and you have my express permission to sell anything you do whenever you follow along with one of these. I want you guys to be successful and to have fun. And you know, when you sell artwork, you can then put that money back in and buy some more material. If you like this stuff, if you like this channel and you want to support it, I have a whole bunch of links down below. Um, simply liking and subscribing helps out a lot. And I do have the Patreon and other means as well. All right. Now let's see how I want to go about doing these. Um, let me grab my pigments. Let's 
do raw sienna, Payne's gray. I'll take a different approach than my bigger trees that I usually paint. I take the hake and I'll put a lot of foliage in that. And I really love interior uh, scenes where you're kind of looking in a stream, you're looking out through an opening between trees. So I enjoy trees that span the um, almost the vertical portion of the page from top to bottom. Um, that's something that I'm used to seeing down in Louisiana. But the vast grand scenes like this, the Hudson River Valley scenes, the um, portions that aren't you know, flat, swampy Louisiana, uh, especially deep south Louisiana, you're going to kind of want to, or I'm going to want to play a little bit differently than I do with the swamp sizes. And I had mentioned how the watercoloring hasn't been really been taking place every day this summer. It's been uh, exploring different mediums and um, compositions. If I was a little bit more deft with the hake at the moment, I'd probably be using it at this point. But it's all about exploring, experimenting, and seeing what works for you. Um, playing around with basics, uh, finding a way to ground these trees. That's what I'm doing right now, is putting these darker marks at the bases. Playing with our variation in size. In fact, okay, so this is kind of a uh, epiphany for me, is that if I'm painting from a photograph, for example, um, a few years ago, I helped, uh, I pretty much was one of the people running collegiate nationals for powerlifting uh, for the United States. And the guy live streaming it, this uh, gentleman, uh, Kronk, he, like me and him were hanging out the whole time, and he had requested a painting from California, uh, not California, uh, Colorado, where he lives. And he had sent me a picture. And when I sat down to paint it, it was about an hour, let's say an hour and a half that I put into it. And I think I filmed the process because I, I like filming most of what I do. And I find that this approach is very similar to the approach that I take when I'm painting from a photograph. So what I think I'm trying to get at is that doing a sketch beforehand changes the style that I paint in and my approach. And that's probably why I'm able to get within this size and scheme. I hope that's making sense. I'm trying to bring some closer uh, trees now. And these guys, I'll bring down their reflections. Played with gouache yesterday um, in the video that I was talking about in the painting. And um, with that gouache, I was kind of doing it uh, subtractively, kind of putting it in to put my whites back. But I'm very happy with how this one's coming out, and I think there's just a really important lesson within this. Um, yesterday, like I said, I was having difficulty with it, having, uh, um, actually had a headache too. I don't know if it was just because I was uh, struggling or what, but anyway, with then coming back to it, sketching it in Conte, and thinking about the issues and reapproaching it, I think that's probably the definition of a, of a painter, of an artist, is that we have a puzzle, we have something that we're trying to solve, and we're thinking about how we can make that happen.
the dry brush effect that I'm getting right here. It's very pleasant. This is kind of feeling like a little bit of a victory lap right now. It's always nice um, when you do a painting and it, and it works out. And I, um, I love monochromatic painting. Sometimes I step far away from uh, using any colors and it throws you for a trip. Painting monochromatic is really easy. It's a lot of fun. If you haven't tried it yet, I highly recommend it. Just grab some burnt umber and play around. Gamboge, gamboge, put a little bit in there. I think I'm gonna do a dry off and we'll take a look. All right, so I'm not completely done. Um, I do want to grab a little bit of white gouache and put in maybe a sailboat. Um, I'm just going to grab directly from the tube. There we go. I don't like putting it out on the palette. I've talked about that quite a bit, how it um, has a tendency to make the palette all chalky just can kind of contaminate everything but if you use it often it might be something you'd want to just have on the palette um, what else the bleed proof white you can use that that's very um, striking I think that's good enough right there. We'll put some birds in the sky as well. Your wash water is gonna get chalky as well, so just be aware that that'll happen. Um, but I do wanna grab a dark or a gray and we'll throw in some birds. We could use the micron pen if you want to just throw in sails and riggings and parts of the boat. I'll just make those two gestural marks. And then we'll sign it. So I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for watching. Uh, thanks for bearing with me during the, um, the, the crisis of trying to refigure out some of the stuff that I had I felt like I had moved away from for a little bit. Um, with these scenes, with sketching them, and like I said, it's just an imaginary scene, but it helped me kind of lay out some of the things on paper that I had floating in my head and then um, just use them as slight references throughout this, what, 20, 30 minute painting. So uh, that helped immensely. So that might help you all out too. So thank you so much. You all have a great day, and I will be back soon with more videos. Take care. Bye.